Your Excellency, the Vice President of Nigeria, the Chair of the International Advisory Board of the African Study Center, and distinguished members of the Advisory Board, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Wale Adebanwe, and I'm the Director of African Study Center here at Oxford. On behalf of the African Study Center, I'm very happy to welcome you all to the inauguration of, the new, of our newly constituted International Advisory Board and a special lecture by the Vice President of Nigeria, Professor Yemi Oshibayo. We are especially pleased that, apart from delivering the lecture, the Vice President will also formally inaugurate the board. We are happy to welcome the Vice President at a time when the Center is strengthening its position as a global center for the study of Africa, while also repositioning so as to attract more students from the African continent as well as students from elsewhere in the world, to study Africa in the oldest university in the English-speaking world. Oxford African Studies Center is one of the world's leading centers of African studies. Through the history of the study of Africa in Oxford long preceded the founding of the center in 2004. The center has since become the focal point for graduate level work and faculty research on Africa in Oxford. Alongside a vibrant doctoral program, the MSc in African Studies, which was inaugurated in 2005, is already recognized as one of Europe's most prestigious and most successful training programs in the field. The center has trained graduate students who are now holding important positions in different spheres of socioeconomic and political life in Africa and the rest of the world. With particular strengths in the social sciences and humanities, the center enjoys a reputation for high quality, relevant research that plays a leading role in academic debates as well as public policy. Members of the center are affiliated to and teach in other faculties and departments in the university, including politics and international relations, social and cultural anthropology, history, law, and criminology. Apart from hosting and working with regional study groups and running frequent workshops and conferences, to disseminate research findings and publicize topical issues. The center runs a weekly seminar on Thursdays, where scholars and postdoctoral researchers in Oxford and different parts of the world present their work. The center also regularly hosts prominent African statesmen, example today, <laughs> leaders, entrepreneurs, social activists, intellectuals, thinkers, scholars, writers, artists, and others who are interested, interested in Africa and African affairs. In fact, we can describe this week as African Leaders Week in Oxford. <laughs> on Tuesday, with the Said Business School, we co-hosted the president of Gabon. On Wednesday, we co-hosted the president of Botswana. Today, we are hosting the vice president of the world's largest concentration of black people in the world. <laughs> this is perhaps another reminder to our students and prospective students that when you come to our centers to study, you will not only be taught by some of the most accomplished Africanist scholars in the world, you will also have the opportunity to interact with the thinkers and leaders who are shaping the continent now and in the future. Our advisory board is being inaugurated today to help us in repositioning and strengthening the center's work. Members of the board are global leaders, statesmen and women, professionals, entrepreneurs and philanthropists who will help us in the goal of providing more opportunities for students from Africa to study at Oxford. The board will also help us in enhancing the global profile and visibility of the center, specifically, <coughs> specifically and research and teaching on, on, on Africa in Oxford uh, generally, facilitating directly and indirectly fundraising, primarily for scholarships and endowment for students from Africa, and also for short and long-term grants and fellowships for scholars from Africa and academic chairs and lectureships for research and teaching on Africa in the university. They will also help in creating linkages between the center, including other units in the university devoted to research on Africa, and global <coughs> and local institutions and organizations in Africa and elsewhere, towards strengthening and broadening the global remit of the center in teaching, research, and service. They will also help us in opening up possibilities that will enrich the mission of the center in other ways possible, including helping in bringing prominent African statesmen, leaders, and others to visit and speak uh, at the center. We want to ensure that anyone who has anything important to say in Africa 
and wants to say it outside Africa and comes to Oxford to say it. <laughs> Let me thank the distinguished members of the board who graciously accepted our invitation to join the board and serve the cause of education and human development. The chair of the board, the newly appointed South African Minister of Finance, <coughs> Mr. Tito Mboweni, who I first met at uh, Bellagio uh, a few years ago, and I found him to be such a sunny character that I uh, have stayed in touch with him. <laughs> Our Excellency, the First Lady of the Republic of Namibia, Madam Monica Gengos. Our Excellency, the former First Lady of Zambia, Dr. Charlotte Alan Scott. His Excellency, Nigeria's former founder and representative of the United Nations, Professor Ibrahim Gambari, who has never said no to any request I made to him. <laughs> His Excellency, the Governor of Kaduna State, Nigeria, Malam Nasir El Rufai, Development Economist, Mr. Alex Duncan, Founder and Managing Director of DLO Energy Group, Ms. Linda Mabena Olabuju, <coughs> and Mr. Avo uh, Ayemandua, uh, the Ghanaian Economist and Author, and finally, Mr. Garrett Ackerman, the Chairman of Pick and Pay. You literally do that after you are paid. <laughs> My colleagues and I and our students look forward to working with you to achieve the strategic plan of the center. I finally, again, thank the Vice President for accepting our invitation, and I thank you all for your presence here today. Good evening, uh, Mr. Vice President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, Professor Yemin Osinjabo. Sorry. Distinguished members of the International Advisory Board of the African Studies Center, uh, Professor Wale, Director of the ASC, um, colleagues, students, friends. My name is Tim Power, and I'm the new incoming head of school of the Oxford School of Global and Area Studies. And uh, Professor Adebanmi has kindly asked me to say a few words before we get started this evening. So it's my pleasure to extend a warm welcome to all of you on behalf of the Oxford School for Global and Area Studies and also on behalf of St. Anthony's College. Our warden, uh, Professor Roger Goodman, unfortunately could not be with us here this evening, but he sends his best wishes to the Vice President, to his delegation, and to all members of the uh, new International Advisory Board. Together, St. Anthony's and the Oxford School for Global and Area Studies form the largest collection of area studies scholars anywhere in the world. In Oslo alone, we maintain institutes and programs that cover seven important regions of the world. In Oslo, we're approaching 160 postgraduate students, over 40 full-time faculty, dozens of early career researchers, and academic visitors from all over the world, many of whom hail from Africa and call, who are proud to call the African Studies Center their home away from home here in Oxford. So I, I see here many of the students who are here on the MSc in African Studies. Uh, this is Friday of week one. Five percent of your MSc is already over, if you can believe it. <laughs> so time to crack the books. Uh, we are an unusual, but I think a very innovative university in that we've chosen to house a large number of our area studies programs within a single unified structure. This provides to us intellectual value added and a stimulating environment for our students and researchers. It helps us to combine a deep, contextually sensitive knowledge of world regions, which is embodied here in Oxford by our world-leading African Studies Center, and apply this knowledge to global issues of paramount importance. The Oxford School for Global and Area Studies is where these global issues meet regional expertise, like we have assembled here in this room tonight. One of the cross-cutting issues that engages all of our area study centers here in Osga is how to secure human development in a context of mounting political and economic challenges. That's why we're so delighted that a leading Nigerian voice will be here this evening to address us on the topic. We couldn't imagine a better combination of a compelling theme with a distinguished practitioner. So it's a pleasure to welcome you, sir, and your guests to St. Anthony's College and to Osga. Thank you very much. <laughs> Your Excellency, Mr. Vice President, distinguished members of the African Studies International Advisory Board, esteemed colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, my name is David Pratt and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all here to St. Anthony's College. Um, to echo uh, Wale and Tim's words of welcome, 
everyone I can see here, colleagues, students, staff, friends, <coughs> has made an enormous contribution to the African Studies Centre since its inception in 2005. And we're very grateful for that. We're not always in the same room. We don't always say thank you. With your continuing support and with the help of our new International Advisory Board, we hope to build on our achievements and to make Oxford a leading centre for the study of Africa. Now, as a student of Nigeria, I'm honoured to introduce this evening's lecture by His Excellency, Professor Yemi Osimbajo. Vice President of Nigeria. Professor Osibajo is one of us. He is a scholar. He's a graduate of the University of Lagos and the LSE. And in 1994, he became a Professor of Law and then Head of the Department of Public Law at the University of Lagos. He's a practicing lawyer and a senior advocate of Nigeria. With the return to multi-party democracy in Nigeria, Professor Osimbajo applied this legal expertise to public service. And between 1999 and 2007, he was a member of the cabinet of the Lagos State Government, where he served as Attorney General and Commissioner for Justice. Professor Osimbajo's political career has extended from the state to a federal level since then. He was an architect of the political manifesto of the All Progressives Party, the first opposition party to win a presidential election in Nigeria, and he was sworn in as Vice President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria in May 2015. Yeah. Professor Osimbajo is also an ordained pastor in the Redeemed Christian Church of God. I read somewhere that he considers himself to be on loan from that role. <laughs> <laughs> so with his legal, political and spiritual perspectives, Professor Osimbajo is uniquely positioned to reflect on the themes of this evening's lecture, which is titled, The Challenges of Human Development in 21st Century Africa. Thank you very much. Uh, director staff of the African Studies Center, members of the International Advisory Board of the African Studies Center, uh, distinguished friends and colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, first, let me say how deeply honored I am by this invitation to the African Studies Center uh, for, uh, this, for this lecture. Uh, I must say that um, they, for me, this is this is very coming to a university. It is uh, is a picnic. It really is. It's, 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 it's wonderful. It's incredible. After mixing with uh, politicians, this is one of the most civilized governments. <laughs> I have the pleasure to address in a while. <laughs> the other good thing, of course, is, the other good thing, of course, about uh, the university is that you, no matter what nonsense you say, you'll find at least someone who will agree with you. <laughs> I, so I really am extremely pleased to be here and very deeply honored uh, to be here at, and to have been invited to speak uh, today. Although clearly, you know, the Oxford study of Africa is decades ahead of the 2004 establishment of the center, it is commendable indeed that the Africa Studies Center has, in a few short years, become one of the world's leading centers of African studies. <coughs> but this center's role is, in the aspect of the shaping of policy and ideas, is bound to become even more crucial as Africa enters possibly its most decisive two decades. This is because it is evident that there are at least four important respects that Africa will hold the balance of world development in the next two decades. The first is in world population, demography. The second is environment and climate change. The third is in production, especially agriculture, manufacturing, and technology. 
and the fourth is in social exclusion under which rubric comes poverty and human capital development and its implications for global security. Africa's failure or success on these issues will profoundly impact the fortunes of mankind. And I don't think that that overstates the point at all. But as interlocutors in this imminent dispensation, your work is certainly uh, cut out for you. This afternoon, I'll be speaking for a few minutes on a salt team on one of these defining issues, the challenges of human capital development in the 21st century, in 21st century Africa. But as you might guess, I will, in the course of the lecture, draw mainly from the Nigerian experience. As a political functionary of one of Africa's 54 states, I'm never quite certain of the diplomatic implications of leaving out bad statistics about other states. <laughs> never quite sure how that would be taken. But in my country, it isn't such a problem. I know what the opposition will say. They say stuff like, yes, the vice president admits that the government has messed up. You know, or at last the truth is out, something like that. So at least we can handle that. We deal with that every day. But seriously though, Nigeria accounts for 20% of Africa's population and its performance weighs quite heavily on continental indices. Nigeria is already beginning to show up in global discourse, sometimes as having the highest number of people in absolute poverty, although there are disputes here and there about that. Its progress, therefore, matters because, by current projections, Nigeria will be the third most populous country in the world in 2040, <coughs> with up to 400 million people. This is in just 22 years. Of course, if we get it right, and we must, such a population could herald demography, a demographic dividend. The alternative scenario, of course, is a perfect storm of population pressures on natural resources, the socioeconomic consequences of a huge jobless youth population, and climate change-induced environmental damage. To get some clarity about the concept of human capital development, it's perhaps useful to note that it is sometimes described from the prism of absolute values. <coughs> but I think its more popular iteration today is as a relative measure of achievements in human progress. So considerable effort has already gone into developing parameters for its measurement. And I'm sure we're very familiar with several of these, uh, of these parameters. The Human Development Index, or HDI, or the UNDP, which assess, assesses progress in health, knowledge, and income per capita. The HDI has itself spawned many refinements and derivatives, including the multidimensional poverty index developed here at Oxford by the Oxford Poverty <coughs> and Human Development Initiative. And of course, this measures uh, a plethora of uh, indices uh, which relate generally to the impact of individuals and communities at their household level, such as lack of access to toilets, water, electricity, cooking fuels, and such like. Then we have the Gender Inequality Index, you know, which evaluates the percentage of potential development that is lost due to gender inequality across various dimensions, including reproductive health, economic participation, and political leadership. The World Bank Human Capital Index, which will be released sometime today, focuses on child survival, education, and health. As, as, as you probably uh, know, uh, there is considerable overlap in these indexes, and this is not surprising given that they share a common provenance with the capabilities approach of Amartya Sen. He's the one who I'm sure you know we all know developed uh, this very idea, this idea uh, that uh, places emphasis on the capability or freedom of individuals to live the kind of lives they value, rather than on the availability of resources to live a good life. In other words, understanding what sorts of deprivation prevent the ability to live a good life is a better method, according to him, for human capital development than focusing merely on income per capita. The various indexes are useful. They're useful snapshots of the issues that matter in ensuring that human capital contributes to future growth. 
and they make at least three important points. The first is that human capital development is inextricably linked to multidimensional poverty. Not surprisingly, the countries that perform worst <coughs> in the measurements of human capital also have to contend with poverty. According to the World Bank, human capital explains up to 30% of the differences in per capita between countries. Another insight to be gleaned from the various indexes is that Africa, especially Sub-Saharan Africa, is lagging behind the rest of the world in terms of human capital development. The highest ranked African country in the Human Development Index is number 63 in the world. The scale of poverty in Africa is huge by any of the measures that we use. While the proportion of poor Africans living below the current levels of absolute poverty of less than $1.90 has reduced from 56% to 40% more recently, the absolute numbers may actually have increased from about 280 million to over 400 million people today. Of course, this is on account of the, you know, the huge population, the growth rates that have gone up everywhere. Human capital development in Nigeria and Congo and Ethiopia, three of the larger countries in Africa by population size, is also unsatisfactory. Despite recent improvements, Nigeria is ranked 157 out of 189 countries in the world, the UNDP Human Development Index, while Congo was ranked 176 and Ethiopia 173. In terms of, and these of course are the three largest uh, countries in terms of population. In terms of education, two in five African Africans are illiterate. And despite increases in enrollment, there are still huge gaps in the quality of education. <coughs> Nigeria has about nine million out of school children of primary, age, primary school age which is said to be one of the highest in the world. Of those in school, only 20% have actually completed public primary education, who actually completed public primary education, were found, to be, were found to be able to read, and we're looking at statistics from about five years back. The picture is not much different for health outcomes, although substantial progress has been made in some areas, such as tackling malaria and eradicating polio. Nigeria is one year away from being certified polio free. However, there's still a lot more, still a lot more to be done. Malaria, diarrhea, and pneumonia, which are critical, account for 74% of under five mortality in Nigeria, and which if things not change, is projected to have the most under five deaths in the world by 2021. The picture of under five malnutrition and stunting is also quite dark. A disaggregation of the indexes at regional and national level also reveals huge disparities in regional and sub-national performance. While no African country is in the very high category at the global level, five countries are considered to have a high human development index. 13 of them are in the medium category, while 32 populate the lower uh, categories of the index. These disparities are not much different at the sub-national level in Nigeria, for example. While the proportion of children out of school in the total population of, a sta of the state, for example, in Lagos, is just 1.83. So Lagos has 1.83, the percentage of 1.83% out of school. Gombe in the northeast, as another state of Nigeria in the northeast, has 24.12%. In Anambra state, a state in the southeast, the proportion of children of school age out of school is 6.22. While in Bauchi State, you know, in the, in the, in the north, it is 55.59%. Now these disparities also reflect to some extent the attention that the states pay to these issues. The attention that individual states pay to these issues, especially as primary and secondary education are really sub-national matters. <laughs> also useful, as all these uh, metrics are, to show the scale of the challenge, they can neither by themselves convey the reality of the misery of poverty, nor can they reflect the psychological burden of poverty or the reality of poverty as exclusion, which is so poignantly put by Mother Teresa, who said, and I quote, being unwanted, unloved, uncared for, forgotten by everybody, 
I think that's a much greater hunger, a much greater poverty than the person who has nothing to eat and afford. This loss of dignity and disempowerment is in many ways the face of poverty anywhere in the world and consequently of poor human capital development. <coughs> so what are the key factors responsible for poor human capital development in Africa? And I'm sure as I go through them, you'll see that some of them you know, sound like consequences as well as causes. So these include poverty, unemployment, conflicts, climate change and environment, poor policy choices, corruption, and the phenomenon of illicit financial flows, and underinvestment in human capital growth. So the causes that I've said, you know, uh, such as poverty, for example, are at once a cause as well as a consequence of poor, of poor human capital development. The poor are, of course, unable to procure their basic needs in education, in healthcare, and living standards. Destitute families do not have the wherewithal or savings to invest in their children's education. <coughs> and healthcare is either not available or is simply too expensive. In Nigeria, for instance, 72% of healthcare is paid out of indi individual pockets, which means that the poor and destitute find it difficult to access even basic <coughs> health services. Unemployment rates are high on the continent, the num simply because the number of new entrants to the job market far outstrip the, job, uh, the, the, the pace of job creation. Even for the, uh, for the employed, dec decent incomes, of course, are required if we're to make any sort of dent on poverty or on, on human capital development. Conflict is also, of course, a source of poor human capital formation. Paul Collier, I'm sure I'm familiar with him around here, has estimated, for instance, that typically a seven-year civil war will reduce GDP by 15% over that period. And many of the civil conflicts in Africa tend to just last about that long. So that's roughly about 2% drop in GDP every year. Certainly, mm. there is some merit in, 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 in many of these arguments. The northeast of Nigeria, which has been an arena for of a brutal terrorist campaign by Boko Haram and lately uh, ISIS West Africa and has seen an attendant decline in farming and other commercial activity, the rise in malnutrition, disruption of education, and of course the consequence is low levels of human capital development. Although as I'll point out later, you know, uh, Borno State really offers some interesting dimensions, especially <coughs> in more recent times, or we'll, we'll, we'll come to that in a moment. The environment and climate change is increasingly becoming also one of the most prominent inhibitors of human capital development in Africa, especially with the rise in extreme weather events such as flash floods, desertification, drought, and you know, unseasonal occurrences, and, the, and, and, and several, se se several other, uh, several other uh, events, several other <coughs> Uh, view events that have created problems for uh, those who farm and for different forms of life. <coughs> Recently, we've had in Nigeria, you know, terrible <coughs> flooding in about nine states. <coughs> several farmlands have been destroyed on account of this, and of course, several homes have you know, been underwater. And of course, these are largely on account of, of climate change. Lake Chad, Africa's fourth largest lake, which is surrounded by Nigeria, by Niger, Chad, and Cameroon, in 1960 covered 25,000 square kilometers in 1960. Today, it has shrunk to less than 1,350 square kilometers. So the water that it provided for irrigation, for fishing, for livestock, for millions, is now practically non-existent. And of course, the implications for, you know, for those who live in, the, in, 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 in that uh, neighborhood, and of course those who work, those who farm, and those who rear cattle. Poor policy choices, including uh, structural adjustment programs, must also take some of the responsibility for poor human capital development outcomes in Africa. At the height of the structural adjustment programs in Africa, UNICEF commissioned a path-breaking study called Adjustments with a Human Face. Essentially, that study highlighted the <coughs> negative impact that structural adjustment policies were having, were having on education, 
on health and child welfare. And they call for more attention to the date to <coughs> human development and poverty in the design of adjustment programs. Economic policies in nations with large numbers of the poor must prioritize that sort of reality. But closely linked to the issue of poor choices is the problem of illicit financial flows from Africa. And of course, this is all related to the general uh, question of corruption. According to uh, the Mbeki high-level panel on illicit financial flows, comprising tax evasion, money laundering, and abuse of public laws, <coughs> that report says that various problems are responsible for a minimum outflow of $80 billion from Africa. The panel found that illicit financial flows had a direct effect on the provision of school clinics, sanitation, security, water, and social protection. It cited a study showing that illicit financial flows impacted negatively on achieving the infant mortality targets of the Millennium Development Goals. It found that without illicit financial flows, the Central African Republic, for example, would achieve its MDG, uh, would achieve its MDG targets in four, in four, in, in, in four, uh, its MDG targets in four categories in 45 years instead of 218 years at the current rate of progress. Equally striking was Mauritania, where the same target will be achieved in 19 years instead of 198 years, and the Republic of Congo in 10 years rather than 120 years. More interesting, of course, was the finding that if illicit financial flows had been arrested by the turn of the century, Africa would have met its four targets, MDG's four targets, all of them by 2016, if illicit financial flows had been arrested. Now, the question, of course, is that you know, very frequently we're unable to understand you know, or our publics are unable to understand the impact of corruption on, on, on living standards, the impact of corruption on human capital development and all of that. Because we don't make these sorts of connections. We don't, people don't understand those connections. For example, you know, I was saying that there was a, a fraudulent contract, a fraudulent oil contract in Nigeria that cost us $3 billion. $3 billion was stolen on account of this fraudulent uh, contract about yeah, three or four years ago. Now, with one with one billion of that, that, that one billion of that amount of money, just that one billion dollars would have accounted for our education and health budgets. Current education and health budgets, just one billion dollars. You can imagine what three billion dollars would have done. Now those connections sometimes are difficult for people to understand unless they are made, unless they are made repeatedly, because People will even sometimes say to you that, well, I mean, because <coughs> many, especially in Africa, where very, where uh, very few people actually pay taxes. You know, of course, as you can imagine, you know, uh, in, uh, Nigeria, for example, we have a tax to GDP of about six percent. So tax return is low, although that has gone up considerably. Now, when people don't pay taxes, it's very difficult to understand. You know, when you say somebody has stolen money, you know. If you, if, so, if, you, if you say, well, this fellow stole a large sum of money, if, if you don't pay taxes, it's very difficult for you to quickly see the link between how this affects you. But in places where taxes are paid, and those who pay taxes, it's easy to say that the fellow has stolen taxpayers' money. And so that has that greater relevance. <laughs> and, I think, and, I, and, I think that's, and I think that it's important, I mean, to, to explain sometimes why you know, you, people sometimes get away with even just simply giving any kind of explanation for stealing public resources and, you know, the way that accountability sometimes is slow, and the, the way that um, uh, the law is sometimes slow in catching up uh, with those individuals. Underinvestment is, without a doubt, a contributory factor to low human capital development in Africa in circumstances in which the poor are unable to invest in their human capital needs the onus may fall on governments to do so. However, this has historically been difficult because of resource constraints. Apart from losses due to leakages, <coughs> government revenue may be constrained by a low economic base, poor tax administration, and existing indebtedness. In the case of Nigeria, underinvestment reflects a historical failure 
to give required priority to spending on human capital requirements. Until recently, Nigeria did not have a program dedicated to social protection on a scale that such, on, on, on a large scale, you know, such that despite having the highest poverty rates amongst uh, lower middle income countries, it spent only 0.3% of GDP on social protection as of 2014 and early 2015. Prior uh, to recent interventions, our public health spending as a proportion of GDP was also said to be one of the lowest. The federal government's capital allocation to the health sector was increased from 22.7 billion naira in 2015 to 86.5 billion naira this year, while the allocation to education increased fourfold from 23.5 billion in 2015 to 102 billion in 2018. Uh, interesting and comfortable uh, fact that a lot of our political opponents don't want to hear is that despite earning 60% less, we're, do we're doing four or five times more in terms of investment in, 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 uh, in investments in human capital development. Thank you very much. You guys are obviously not the opposition. No. <laughs> so let me look very quickly at government's role in providing human capital. Clearly, uh, improving human capital development must be a priority of public policy. Indeed, given the scale and extent of multidimensional poverty in Africa, Governments have a moral obligation, a duty to put human capital development at the very top of their concerns. The moral case is clear, and it is also in our collective interest to do so. Poverty, illiteracy, destitution, and a lack of jobs and economic opportunity often feed into feelings of marginalization and dislocation. These in turn manifest in social tensions, in communal conflict, and sometimes you know, over conflicts over scarce resources as a result of population pressures and environmental degradation. In its multi-dimensional form, poverty also implies a deficit in the human capital that underpins long-term development. As policymakers, our very first instinct in tackling poverty is to bake a larger pie <coughs> by boosting growth so that there is more to go around. However, in the face of high inequality, rapid growth by itself cannot translate to reduced poverty. Rapid growth by itself cannot. Indeed, we have seen in Nigeria that at a time of growth in the order of 6 to 7%, unemployment increased. The phenomenon, as we're told, of jobless growth. Botswana is consistently cited as a country with appreciable growth over the long term. But the inequality also is, is significant. Perhaps the best way we, we can say in the circumstances is that there is some nexus between growth and human capital development that leads to desired <coughs> reductions in poverty, perhaps through expanded opportunities and, and the skills and, uh, and, and health to hold down jobs. But clearly, this simply cannot match the scale and speed of interventions that are required to improve health and educational outcomes in Africa. Now this is the rationale for the provision in our in Nigeria's Economic Recovery and Growth Plan for a, a pillar which we describe as investing in our people. Uh, and again, you know, uh, th now this pillar is particularly important and I'll talk just a, a little bit to, uh, about how um, we have taken this, you know, into actual policy and how we've implemented it. Uh, we'll come down to that also in a moment. But it is government uh, that has the powers of taxation to raise the resources for wide provision of basic social needs. Government also is best placed to deploy the public policy tools required to bring about synergy between growth objectives and social needs. Most notable in this regard will be the striking a balance between expenditure items and the public budget especially capital expenditure that will boost growth in the long run, and the direct provision of resources to tackle poverty. The trade-off is not always an easy one to make, especially when resources are scarce. One of the very frequent arguments that we have at uh, budget uh, meetings and economic management meetings is really this whole question of how much should you put to 
social protection? How much do you put to social investment? There's almost a sense that social investment is the sort of thing that you, it's almost like arms giving, you know. So you really almost need to be convinced about it almost on a spiritual level to be, to, be able to, get people, to be able to get people to understand, you know, how important this is in terms of economic policy. And these, these, arguments, these, these arguments continue. But I think that it is becoming more important and becoming more, uh, and I think people are beginning to accept more, that this, especially for poor countries, especially for countries where you have large numbers of, of, of poor people, that this should be the beginning of economic planning. It should be the priority in terms of economic planning. When, when times are hard, you know, of course, some people see interventions to mitigate the effects of poverty as pandering to people who are not working while others are struggling to make ends meet. You know, I mean, for instance, we had some arguments recently. Uh, we we uh, got funds which were returned from uh, what is described as the Abacha loot, about $320 million. Were returned, uh, was returned to Nigeria from uh, uh, where it was stuck uh, after the attempt uh, to steal it. It got stuck in, in Switzerland and was returned to us. Now, we decided, along with, no, 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 we did not decide, that they, they, the court, the Swiss court, actually said that it was only going to be released on the condition that it was applied to some social cause with the supervision of the World Bank. Of course, we argued back and forth, you know, all of that, but eventually we agreed, and so, you know. But when we then decided to apply it to our conditional cash transfers transfer scheme, there were several people who argued that, why are you giving all this money? away, you know, and why don't you go and build infrastructure or do something with it? So we're always going to have those tensions whenever you're putting money aside for, uh, for social development or social investment, there will always be those arguments about whether or not this isn't just a waste, uh, a waste of money. So we see uh, that aside from governments, non-governmental organizations and philanthropic organizations also help to bridge the funding gaps. In Nigeria, for example, significantly the Dangote Foundation with its partner, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, have worked closely with governments and international partners to scale up interventions in healthcare. Similarly, the Illuminu Foundation has become well known for its interventions in providing entrepreneurship training, not just in Nigeria but across Africa. We found in Nigeria that with a strong will on the part of the of governments, and I, I take again the example of the Bono State government in Northeast Nigeria, and its willingness to partner non-governmental organizations, they were able to contribute, you know, noteworthy educational outcomes. So despite the brutal insurgency and terrorism of Boko Haram, Bono was able to maintain relatively low levels of out-of-school children as a share of local population. The percentage was 6.39%, which was much higher than the levels in the South, and one quarter of the level in the neighboring states, in the neighboring Golden states, for example. So it is possible where there is very active participation of the state government working with uh, the development agencies, and where there's political will, and, and I must say, that Kaduna State uh, has also shown great political will and worked with many of the development agencies. As a matter of fact, some people ask why it is that all the development agencies spend all their time <laughs> in Kaduna State. I suspect that uh, it, it has to do with some of the key issues that they. It's a local delicacy. It, uh, so let's just talk very quickly about. Uh, some of the human capital development initiatives that we've tried to introduce in Nigeria. Um, to promote growth, and I'll just go through this very quickly, to, move, to promote growth, we have accorded priority to macroeconomic stability and continued diversification of our economy from direct or indirect dependence <coughs> on crude oil exports. Now, this is quite an important point because, you know, generally speaking, of course, you know that when oil prices rise, there is growth, you know. Now, I don't want to go into too much of the detail of that, but the truth of the matter is that rising oil prices or increased oil production does not of itself create jobs because the oil industry by itself creates very few jobs indeed. 
So there is a need to use the oil resources to diversify the economy. And so those who say that we should no longer be dependent on oil are always faced with uh, the argument that we need this oil so that we can diversify. So we need oil to get away from oil. So you see that, you know, so you see that, you know, where, where there are all these uh, tensions. We've also prioritized spending on infrastructure, railroads, and power in particular. Despite earning 60% less, as I said at the previous administration, we spent 2.7 trillion naira in two budget cycles on capital, the highest in the nation's history. We've also executed a comprehensive phased plan for ease of doing business which earned us 24 places higher in, in the World Bank Ease of Doing Business Index, <coughs> in commendation as one of the top 10 reforming economies in the world. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we also particular, we're also particular about reducing inflation, which eats, of course, into the limited purchasing power, especially of the poor, who do not have much of a choice in changing the basket of goods that they consume. However, a major premise of our economic model was a focus on empowering the jobless youth and millions in extreme poverty by a mix of microcredit schemes, welfare for the most vulnerable, and direct creation of jobs. So we adopted a policy of support for rural farmers by the provision of direct credit to farmers <coughs> at below market rates in what we described as an anchor borrowers program. Now that program is planned to create a linkage between large anchor companies, large anchor agricultural companies, and smallholder farmers of specified commodities. The idea is to provide subsidized credit to smallholder farmers so that they can boost production with guaranteed uptake by the anchor companies. So far, we spent in total about 55 uh, billion naira, and we disbursed this to close to 300,000 farmers and another 250,000 farmers are waiting for their own disbursements. So this direct credit to uh, farmers, this direct credit to farmers who already have off-takers, is one that we found <coughs> to, uh, to work very, very well indeed, especially with rice production. We were importing $5 million of rice every day in, in, in Nigeria up until the end of 2016. And we're no longer importing uh, that. We're, we're down to 2% of, of imports. All the rice we consume now is just 2% of imports. And we're now producing about 17 million metric tons of paddy rice. We have issues, of course, with milling, uh, uh, milling that rice. But we, we, we think that we will be completely self sufficient in rice production, in tomato production, and several others. Of course, there is arable land, there is the, the resources are there, and there's absolutely no reason why we should be importing food in the way that we have been importing food. But it always takes uh, a downturn in oil prices, it always takes some hardship <laughs> in order to realize uh, that uh, we can do all of these things ourselves. We also launched an energizing economies project, which is basically providing renewable energy, solar power in particular, to markets and economic clusters for small businesses and traders. So the whole idea of this is that we're providing power directly in markets, and we're using solar power in particular in, in several markets across the country, for those who know the country well. Our area market in Aba is one of the largest markets that we have in the country, and we're, you know, uh, we put solar in our area market, so we, we've done about 31,000 shops in all. Sabongari Market in Kano, we've done over 13,000 shops. Sura Market in Lagos, for those who know the place, 1,047. In, in, in general, we've done uh, about over 81,000 shops, servicing about 320,000 MSMEs. Now, the, the idea, of course, is that for those who are familiar with the power problems that we have in Nigeria, we decided that we needed to power economic clusters, especially where you have small businesses because small businesses really are the life and soul of, of, of the economy. And so we decided that it would make more sense to actually you know, take the power to those economic clusters where people were doing their business or, or you know, what was you know, different uh, businesses and different economic activities. And it, we, we've really seen a tremendous improvement in the output of those individuals. For one thing, 
They're able to stay longer for those who want to work later into the evenings. They're able to work later into the evenings. They're able to refrigerate their, their products, those who sell uh, the, the livestock and sell you know, uh, beef and various things, are able to refrigerate as well. But perhaps the most far-reaching policy that we have implemented is the social investment program. In 2016, we budgeted a sum of about 500 billion naira, it's close to $1.5 billion for a multi-dimensional social investment scheme. This is the largest provision for social investment in our nation's history. We made the same provision in the 2017 budget, though we have so far only been able to fund that to about $250 billion in the two budget cycles. The program has six components. The first is a conditional cash transfer scheme under which 5,000 a month, about 15 million, is given to the poorest and most vulnerable households in the country on the condition that they participate in educational, health, and nutritional activities. So far, we've done about 300,000 households. Our immediate target is a million. We think that we should be able to do 700,000 by the end of the year. But one of the most important things about this is that when you look at the sums of money that we're, that we're talking about, it really does sound like, like a little amount of money. But the truth is that what we find <coughs> in all of the places, because these are really the poor, <coughs> is that they're able to use the money for many of their basic needs. And you know, because it is regular, they're able to plan, they're able to invest in, in petty trading and small businesses and all. And we think that we, that one of the most important things to do is not just to keep this steady and expand the network, but also to provide even more, even for more people. Because certainly a million, where you have uh, close to 60 million persons, is barely scratches the surface. So we really need to look at how to improve and to, to increase uh, the, to increase that whole, uh, uh, to, to increase the scope of the uh, CCTs. As I had said earlier. The sum of money which was which returned from their budget with about 320 million is going towards that same uh, the conditional cash transfers. And we think that it might help to improve uh, the numbers with uh, the numbers of those who are giving the cash transfers. Our government enterprise and empowerment program is also an important tool for financially empowering small businesses, artisans, market women, petty traders, and tabletop traders. Two of the popular products of that scheme are called market money and trader money. Now the market money is a short term, is a short term interest free credit of between 50,000 and 300,000 naira for small businesses under the auspices of their cooperative societies. Now that's a risk management device. So we give, you know, sums of between 50,000 and 300,000 naira, uh, the 300,000 uh, 300, naira to small businesses to uh, traders and all of that. But we give it to, through their cooperative societies. Now the cooperative societies help, you know, peer pressure to ensure that these sums are returned. We've had a very, very good, uh, we've had a very good uh, rate of repayment, which has helped greatly in ensuring that, uh, that, that it continues. So today we have almost, we have close to 500,000 small businesses that have accessed that loan. Now the trader money, on the other hand, is a microcredit loan for the bottom of the pyramid trader. Now that bottom of the pyramid trader is the last mile in the retail chain. As a petty trader, whose inventory is usually not even fifteen dollars, so his so his time inventory is just about that. Now many of these traders, who I would describe as the last, you know, really the last mile, are persons who form the largest army of, 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 of traders in, 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 in the country. <coughs> but they've been completely ignored over the years because they are considered too risky for any kind of loan. Many of them are mobile, you know, so generally speaking, nobody wants to give them a loan. But we thought that it would be, that it would be important to ensure that these individuals are able to get loans. And we decided that we will take, you know, uh, we'll, we'll do everything to ensure that we're able to keep a good record of who they are. We have the biometrics, photographs, and all of that. And what we've seen, even in a very short period, 
is that because when you get the 10,000 Naira loan, if you pay back within a six month period, you get 15,000, if you pay back, you get 20,000. We've seen even now that there has been a very, very interesting rate of return. People are actually paying back because obviously you can get more money when you pay back. <laughs> and, and this has proved to be, uh, to be, to be quite uh, successful. So once, uh, you, once you've been able to pay back and you, you get your 20,000, you can then graduate to uh, the, to the um, what is called the market money, which is the 100,000, 50,000 to 300,000. Now, <coughs> two million petty traders, we hope, will be able to benefit uh, from this uh, microcredit scheme. And as you can imagine, it's very, very popular, very popular with the, with the petty traders. The major plank of our approach to empowerment is to improve financial inclusion. Already under the market money scheme, 34, we now have 349,000 new bank accounts. And we hope that we will be able to open bank accounts for another <coughs> 2 million people as, uh, as they get their credit. So we think that this is a very important tool also for financial inclusion. And uh, we think that this will be helpful because it then gives us access, uh, it then gives us access to these traders access to, of course, they, we can bring them properly into, uh, in, into the uh, formal business. They may also, at some point, you know, uh, come into the tax net. You know, that, of course, isn't uh, a matter that uh, you want to discuss in your head very now. Uh, our homegrown school feeding program is also yet another one of these uh, social investment programs. And uh, here we give a free balance meal to over 9.2 million children in 26 states of the Federation so far, in about 45,000 public primary schools. Now the program is operational, you know, it's, or it's been operational now for close to two years, and there are several dimensions of it. The first is that because it's a homegrown school feeding program, the states have to use, in the, in the states, they have to use local produce, livestock, and poultry. Of course, that supports local agriculture. It also provides jobs for about 95,440 cooks, resident, of course, in the various communities in which the schools are located. And the program is also desi designed to improve uh, malnutrition outcomes. And it has improved school enrollment tremendously. I know that uh, when uh, the program took off in Kaduna State, I think they had almost 30% uh, or so yeah. in improvement in, in school enrollment. So it also brings, uh, you know, of course, many, many, many young, uh, many of these children to school. As a portion of working age, uh, the working age group of <coughs> 15 and 59 years continues to increase steadily over the next few years. Nigeria, of course, has the advantage of a demographic, demographic dividend. But harnessing that dividend through appropriate skill development efforts requires an opportunity you know, for us to at least provide something, some way of trading, some way of trading uh, these uh, young men and women. Over the past two years, through what we call the NPAR program, we've been able to offer skill development programs digitally to over 500,000 young Nigerians, of course, between the ages of 18 and 35. We have set a target of scaling 10 million Nigerians by 2023. Now, the Empower program is a jobs program for young graduates, and it is the largest post tertiary employment program in Africa. 500,000 graduates have been recruited as teachers, agricultural extension workers, public health officials, and the process of engaging them has also been somewhat of an eye-opener for us in government. We use a web-based application that provides a level playing field for all applicants, no room for favoritism. You simply apply through this uh, process. You take your tests online, and you are appointed online. And our contact you know, is essentially online. Each of these volunteers is provided with an electronic tablet with which they are trained to provide required services on an ongoing basis. So each of them has the first 200,000, the last 300,000 have only just come on board. 
For the first 200,000, we already have that. <coughs> Each has you know, a device that's just like this one. And that device empowers them to participate in the digital economy as data collectors and as an analysts. It is loaded with uh, training material for various things, from entrepreneurship training to code writing, all manner of training material. NPAR goes straight to the heart of social inclusion through direct job creation and providing uh, these young people with skills for the modern economy. A core plank of our empowerment approach is the provision also of social housing <coughs> in a family homes fund, which is not too dissimilar to uh, some of, the, I think one of the closest examples is, uh, is a similar project in India. Our family homes fund aims to provide up to 500,000 housing units by 2023 using a concessional financing facility to construct houses at less than five million, as well as a home loans assistance program that will enable people at the bottom of the housing pyramid to buy their own homes at subsidized rates. This will be complemented by a rent to own scheme. It's expected that this program will provide another 1.5 million jobs by 2023 in the building materials industry, in construction, and house maintenance, amongst other things. I'll be done in a moment. <laughs> when, when, when you invite a professor <laughs> a vision for the future. Our expanded social investment and protection is the certain objective of the next few years. We intend to maintain and expand our existing programs in social investment. We also envisage additional areas of intervention in collaboration with state governments who are indispensable partners, given our federal arrangements and constitutional division, especially on labor, on health, and educational matters. One major program that we intend to undertake is a rural infrastructure program that will make it easier for agricultural products to get to market while providing jobs for rural dwellers. Of course, improved educational outcomes are crucial to our overall strategy to end extreme poverty reduce inequality, and remain in the path of sustainable growth. While the arguments will range as to just how crucial education is to ending extreme poverty, there's no question that illiteracy or lack of access to quality education is closely associated with poverty. UNESCO's Global Education, uh, education Monitoring Report and the Education Commission, Commission's Learning Generation Report provide important evidence on the impact of education on the individual's earnings and economic growth. They found, for example, that edu uh, education reduces poverty. Of course, as I said, there are arguments back and forth. Increases individual earnings, it reduces economic inequalities, and promotes economic growth. By their estimates, 171 million people could be lifted out of extreme poverty if all children left school <coughs> with basic reading skills. And that's equivalent to about a 12% drop in the world total. Absolute poverty, they also find, could be reduced by 30% from learning improvements as outlined by the Education Commission. So for us, we have a threefold plan to improve educational outcomes. To start with, there will be greater focus on achieving the specified sustainable development goals, such that we can meet the targets for school enrollment, quality of education, adult literacy, and teaching. <coughs> that quality of teaching by 2030. Secondly, we will undertake a program to get the nine million out of school children into school. <clears throat> now, this will be a, a fairly complex, uh, complex process, requiring the full cooperation of state governments, religious authorities, as well as the resources to build schools, equip them properly, <coughs> and train the required number of teachers. But I think that one of the major issues for us also is how to use technology to train large numbers of people. We know that in the coming years, building classrooms will certainly not be the way to go. The numbers simply will require technology to teach, to train teachers, technology to educate, and we're, we're, we're going to have, we're, we're certainly going to be looking at all of the innovative ways of teaching that may not necessarily involve <coughs> the, uh, the formal brick and mortar. Our school feeding program is already leading, as I've said, to improved enrollment and the Empire program can be a source of the initial requirement for teachers. Thirdly, it's evident that our rapidly increasing population 
and the, the, the uh, as they say, the fourth industrial revolution has changed the educational challenge before us quite radically. Given our limited resources and the current gaps in educational attainment, it is quite clear that we have to change both the substance of education that our children receive as well as the methods by which they are educated. We have now identified early stage investment in primary and secondary education as key to achieving <coughs> the economic aspirations of becoming a knowledge driven economy. There's also a general agreement about the importance of STEAM education as opposed to STEM, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math, and the need for a workforce with STEAM skills to drive economic prosperity, and the contribution that STEAM can make in solving the tough problems of the world. Now, this involves, this involves our policy in the introduction of science, technology, engineering, arts, and math curriculum in primary and secondary schools. We recognize that schooling should support the development of skills in cross-disciplinary, critical and creative thinking, problem solving, and digital technologies, which are essential in all of the 21st century occupations. Set against Nigeria's desire for a strong and functional STEAM education is the fact that decades of neglect of basic schooling infrastructure and adequate teacher training must be matched by a focused investment in large-scale and innovative solutions that overlap, uh, that overleap current uh, conditions. The federal government uh, of Nigeria aims to introduce in-class uh, skills, especially you know, uh, economic and interpersonal skills around science, technology, engineering, arts and maths. A countrywide curriculum is in development with coding, digital arts, design thinking, <coughs> robotics, critical thinking, and other skills taken into account in interpreting traditional curriculum topics. The curriculum is one of the crucial components of the program's success. It recognizes the importance of having a well-rounded curriculum that is global in orientation and local in its application. To this end, the curriculum content is sourced in partnership with uh, the Massachusetts <coughs> Institute of Technology, the Oracle Academy, Microsoft, Cisco Academy, and IBM. There's also enthusiastic consensus around the inclusion of practical classes on climate change and the environment in the curriculum from primary to secondary education. Erosion, desertification, flooding are some of the very real effects of climate change that continue to affect livelihoods, especially for rural dwellers who largely depend on agriculture for subsistence. Some notion of disaster risk, risk reduction from form part of our education reality. And we think that that is important, that we must be thinking of how to include you know, some ideas of disaster risk reduction in our curriculum. Our focus on education for sustainable development in the school curriculum aims to promote the knowledge, skills, attitudes, and values necessary to shape a sustainable future. The objective is for climate change education to aid the understanding and complexities and the interconnections of the various challenges posed by climate change. The introduction of, the climate, change, of climate change education will also promote <coughs> learning about the causes and effects of climate change as well as possible responses, providing a cross-curricular and multidisciplinary perspective. It should develop competencies in the field of climate change mitigation and adaptation <laughs> with the aim of promoting climate resilient development and reduce the vulnerability of our community. <coughs> Besides understanding the links between consumption patterns and climate change, this will engender responsible actions and contribute to reduced greenhouse emissions through more sustainable lifestyles. For improved health outcomes in the health sector, we're similarly exploring options for radical reform by ensuring that health gets at least 8% share of any increase in government spending and by ensuring that the recently operationalized basic health care provision fund is used to substantially increase health financing. We're also improving, moving aggressively to change the perverse relationship between primary and tertiary health care, which attracts almost the same level of funding to a 60% primary, 20% secondary, and 20% tertiary allocation of funds. Of course, we are committed to universal health insurance using co-payments in order to share the cost between individuals, the private sector, and the government, while the poorest 40% will be exempted from such co-payments co co 
it's impossible, of course, to fund healthcare using budgets alone. And this is why, for us, universal uh, health insurance is important. But a substantial portion of that will have to be paid, a substantial portion of the premiums will have to be paid by governments until such a time as, uh, as uh, living standards improve. So by this means, we hope to get 40, a 45% increase in the share of the population covered by primary health care by 2023, up from the present 12.6%. Keeping a similar level of ambition we would have 98% coverage by 2028. By similar means, the total government expenditure on health should increase to 7.8% in 2023 as compared to the current level of 5.3%. This year alone, the Basic Health Care Provision Fund contributed an additional $55.15 <coughs> billion to health finances. Improved health outcomes will also entail greater cooperation with the private sector as greater demand arising from health insurance will cause more high quality private hospitals to be built. Already, our National Sovereign Investment Authority has invested $10 million to build a world-class cancer treatment center in Lagos. So, uh, in conclusion, <laughs> going forward, it is clear that we will need more local, granular, and up-to-date statistics on human capacity development and poverty to be better equipped to develop and adapt and implement relevant policies. Data will also be essential in order to track and monitor the outcomes of our various interventions. Obviously, more resources will also be needed to substantially move beyond our current human capacity development situation. But perhaps more importantly, African governments must prioritize investments in people. It's also evident that the multidimensional nature of poverty requires multi-pronged responses. Interventions to increase growth and incomes alone are clearly incomplete and must be matched by interventions to tackle deprivation and destitution. A key lesson is that it is essential in tackling poverty to take long-term perspective while providing short-term support <coughs> to the needy and the most vulnerable. Welfare schemes should be empowerment oriented, offering opportunity to work, especially in rural areas. There's no alternative to ensuring that credit gets to informal traders, the bottom of the pyramid in the, in the trade chain. The challenges of human development in Africa are clearly enormous, but so are the opportunities to significantly move the needle to vastly improve standards of existence for our people. All over Africa, the political will to better the lot of our resting populations is evident. Innovative ideas are in abundance, and if we keep our focus, especially on good governance, the next two decades may truly be the African decades. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. We had a problem in planning these. How do you read the citation for all of these people without taking a whole day? So we settled on five line introduction per member of the advisory board. So I would now ask uh, my colleagues to come in turn to introduce each member of uh, the advisory board, starting with the chair, you stand, and once it's uh, finished, and then you take an handshake with the vice president for a photograph, and when we are done, the vice president will formally proclaim the uh, inauguration of the board. Your Excellency, Mr. Vice President, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Tito Mboweni is an economist, a member of the Board of International Advisors of Goldman Sachs Group, and was the eighth governor of the South African Reserve Bank and the first black South African to hold that post. He served as Labour Minister in President Nelson Mandela's first cabinet. He has been the Chancellor of the University of the Northwest in South Africa, and Professor of Extraordinary in Economics at the University of Stellenbosch, also in South Africa. Between 2010 and 2014, he was the Chairman of Anglo Gold Shanti, currently is a member of the Board of Governors of the Asia School of Business, and founder and member of Umboweni Brothers Investment Holdings, and this week, His Excellency President Ramaphosa saw fit to add a sixth line <laughs> to the last speech, uh, making him the Finance Minister of South Africa. <laughs> I 
hope that your position with us here will be as enjoyable, but perhaps less challenging than your uh, position in South Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Mr. Tito Mboweni, the Chair of the African Study. Zambian Economic and Social Development Specialist and is the former First Lady of Zambia. She served as the Chief of Social Policy and Economic Analysis, Planning, Monitoring and Evaluation for UNICEF Zambia from 2007 until 2012. She also led the team which created and launched the Zambian Public Welfare Assistance Scheme, uh, a social protection and poverty alleviation government program in Zambia. And of course, she is an Oxford alumna. <laughs> Your Excellency, President, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Her Excellency Dr. Charlotte Harlan Scott, a member of the His Excellency, Professor Ibrahim. Gambari is a scholar, a diplomat, and a statesman. He was Nigeria's <coughs> external affairs minister and later permanent representative to the United Nations for almost a decade. He was later appointed as the first Under Secretary and Special Advisor to the Secretary General on Africa. That was from 1999. To 2005. Subsequently, he was appointed UN Under Secretary General for Political Affairs. He's been chairman of the United Nations Special Committee Against Apartheid, UN Secretary General Special Envoy on Cyprus, Zimbabwe, Myanmar, and joint AU UN Special Representative in Darfur, and most recently a Commonwealth Envoy in Zambia. I should also add that through the UN, Professor Gambari was a close associate of Sir Merrick Daunting, Warden of St. Anthony's from 1997 to 2006, and together they established the Atiku, Atiku Abubakar Fellowship at the College. Your Excellency, the Vice President, distinguished guests, let me present to you Professor Ibrahim Gambari. His Excellency Malam Nazir Arufai, by professional training in a state surveyor, is currently the governor of Kaduna State in Nigeria, a place where I've enjoyed doing some of my own research. Before this, he was Minister of the Federal Capital Territory, Abuja. Malam Arufai was before that the Director General of the Bureau of Public Enterprises in charge of the privatization of federal government assets in Nigeria from 1999 to 2003. Uh, as a minister of the Federal Capital Territory, he was also a key member of the very well-regarded economic team of former President Abbas Njoy's second administration. Your Excellency, the Vice President, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I present to you His Excellency, Alam Nazir Arafai, a member of the African Study Centre International Advisory. Mm -hmm. 
Mr. Alex Duncan, a British South African, is the Director of Policy Practice in the UK. Uh, he's worked as a development practitioner, researcher, manager, and consultant economist in many parts of Africa, Asia, and Europe, and at strategic level for several development agencies. He's also worked for the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, the World Bank, and Oxford Policy Management Foundation. Your Excellency, Vice President, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Mr. Alex Duncan, a member of the African Studies Center's International Advisory Board. Ms. Linda Mabena Olagunji is an admitted attorney of the High Court of South Africa and the founder and managing director of DLO Energy Resources Group. This is a wholly black female owned energy investment and advisory company with assets in renewable energy and power sector in South Africa. She is also the founder of Renewables and Energy Forum in South Africa and Ms. Mabena Olagunju received the 2015 Forbes Women Africa Best Emerging Entrepreneur Award and has been acknowledged by Oprah Winfrey as among the 20 most powerful women in Africa. Yes. Your Excellency, the Vice President, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Ms. Linda Mabena Olagunju, a member of the African Studies Center International Advisory Board. Mr. Ivo Ayman Duong is an economic development specialist, literary anthologist of fiction and non fiction works, and currently visiting scholar at the University of Johannesburg. <laughs> He was a special assistant to the former president of the Republic of Ghana, President John IV. He is the founder and CEO of the Center for Intellectual Renewal, Accra, Ghana. Your Excellency, Vice President, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Mr. Ivo. Gareth Ackerman is the chairman of Pick and Pay, the second largest multi-billion dollar supermarket in South Africa, with chains in many countries in Africa. He is a member of the board of Consumer Goods uh, Forum and the co-chair of the Consumer Goods Council uh, of South Africa. Your Excellency Vice President, distinguished guests, Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Mr. Gareth Ackerman, a member of the African Senate. I will now invite the Vice President to formally endorse the report. Since I'm not swearing you in, I want to ask you to stand. <laughs> It really gives me very great pleasure to formally inaugurate the International Advisory Board of the Africa Studies Center of the Oxford University. Through the efforts of the members of the board, I am confident that the center will expand its <coughs> research and teaching and also, and also maintain and excel in its place as the leading center for African studies in the world. In advance of that service, I want to thank each and every one of you, members of the board, for assuming the responsibility of helping the university to support the African Studies Center. Congratulations. May I now invite all the members of the board to come forward and take a photograph uh, with the Vice President and of course we invite the head of the Oxford uh, School of Global and Area Studies to join them for the first official photograph.
Thank you. 